Did you know that there are 4,458 and counting roller coasters in the world today? What's even more mind-blowing is the fact that there are over 700 theme parks worldwide. To properly enjoy most attractions, you need to know that you'll be safe when riding them, and to do that, you need to know how they work. In this video, you will learn the different types of roller coasters, how they work, and what precautions are taken to make sure every rider gets off a lot. There are six major types of coasters, sit-down, inverted, flying, wing, spinning, and 4D. First up is sit-down, the most basic initially, but the type with the most possible variations. The types of sit-down coasters are basic, floorless, hyper coaster, 200 feet or higher, giga coaster, 300 feet or higher, strata coaster, 400 feet or higher, boomerang, launched, wooden or hybrid. Sit-down coasters have the most variance, so they are the most complicated to fully understand. Basic sit-down coasters are similar to floorless coasters in the way that they usually have swooping drops and lots of inversions. Floorless are only different from basics in the way that, like the name suggests, they don't have floor to put your feet on. Hyper coasters are coasters that are over 200 feet tall and usually have lots of big airtime hills and turnarounds. Giga coasters are just like hyper coasters but are 300 feet tall. Strata coasters are 400 feet tall and are launched at high speeds up a vertical top hat maneuver and are plunged back down spiraling on the way. Boomerang coasters are pulled up backwards through a lift hill with a device called a catch car and are dropped back the way they came into a cobra roll and a vertical loop, then slowly pulled up another hill until being released backwards through the whole sequence. Wooden coasters are basically smaller versions of hyper coasters and are made out of wood but some are twistier than others. Hybrid coasters are made mostly out of wood but have steel beams for track and can be even steeper than wooded coasters, as well as invert. The next major type of coaster is inverted. Since debuting with Batman the Ride at Six Flags Great America, inverted coasters have become some of the most popular coasters in the world for their simulated flight experience, which is created by allowing the train to hang down from the track without requiring a bottom to the train. You can see what I mean in this picture. See how the train has no bottom, which creates the feeling that one is flying, sort of. Inverted coasters usually have big swooping turns and drops, and this is due to the fact that since inverted coasters are on the outside of the track instead of the inside, the coaster pulls more forces if swung outward, and more forces means more excitement. They also do not have many airtime hills for the simple reason that it is almost impossible to get airtime when below the track. I'll get into that later. The third type of coaster is flying. Like inverted coasters, since debuting with Stealth at Paramount's, now California's, Great America, flying coasters have become some of the most popular and graceful yet intense rides in the world. On a flying coaster, you enter the train, which is basically an inverted coaster with more restraints, and as you're about to leave the station, the train lifts its back half upwards, putting you into a sitting Superman position. Like inverted coasters, flying coasters are famous for hanging down from the track as well as big swooping turns and drops. The main difference between flying coasters and inverted coasters is the position you sit in, as well as the fact that flying coasters are famous for their inversions, such as the pretzel loop, headfirst vertical loops, and other maneuvers that put you on your back facing upwards at the end of them. Now you can live with your greatest fantasies and fly through the air on these awesome coasters. The fourth type of coaster is wing. Wing coasters are currently only manufactured by B&M, Bollinger and Mabillard, and are graceful and smooth. They are only steel as of right now, and seat riders off to the side of the train like they are riding on the wing of a plane. They are famous for their barrel roll drops, crazy head slash hand chopper moments, and twisting yet graceful inversions. I haven't rode one of these yet, but I would really like to because of how fun and smooth they look. The next type of coaster is spinning. Spinning coasters, along with sit-down and inverted, are some of the most commonly found in the world. They are famous for the fact that riders face each other or sit back to back, and during the ride the circular car spins around 360 degrees multiple times. Sometimes this is a free spin where the car spins without restraint, and sometimes it is a controlled spin where the spinning is started and stops again throughout the ride. They usually have curved drops and are without inversions, but there are some exceptions to the rule. Time Traveler at Silver Dollar City, I'm looking at you. A lot of these coasters give you the unique experience of facing backwards through some of the ride, which is pretty neat. The fifth and final type of coaster is 4D. 4D coasters are probably the most unusual type of coaster in the world. 
They were built only by Aerodynamics until now, and there are not many original ones left in existence. They are characterized by their massive, unusual structures, and typically red and black paint scheme. They are special because the seats you sit on are positioned similarly to wing coasters, but the seats are programmed to rotate on a 360 degree axis back and forth at certain parts of the ride. It's really freaky, actually. The only standing rides of this kind are Ayanaka, Dinaconda, and X2. There is actually another type of 4D coaster manufactured by the combination of SNS Worldwide and Rocky Mountain Construction, RMC. This type of 4D coaster has a vertical lift hill and the rotating cars freely rotate as opposed to being programmed to rotate in certain ways, providing for a super unique experience. <laughs> Most people have the common fear of thinking they are going to fly out of the coaster car or derail off the track and die. This is a common misconception, but as I said, it is only a misconception. Restraints, whether they be a lap bar or an over the shoulder restraint, are programmed to not move until the ride out presses a button on their control panel. This way, even if your seatbelt comes undone, that restraint won't be moving an inch until the ride op says it can. The things that prevent you from flying off the track are the wheels themselves. Most coaster trains have a set of three wheels on both sides somewhere on each car. There is a wheel on top, a wheel on the bottom, and a wheel on the side, all connected. The wheel on the bottom is called an upstop wheel, and it is what prevents the train from derailing when going over an airtime hill, because it hugs the bottom of the rail and since the wheels are all connected, the train can't fly off. The wheel on this side is called a side friction wheel, and like an upstop wheel, it prevents the trains from derailing on the turns as long as they are properly banked, tilted, and transitioned since they are all connected. Here's an image that shows how the wheels are set. Even though it must seem like the most boring part of the ride, the lift hill is actually fairly complex. There are two main types of lift hills, chain lift and cable lift. Chain lifts are the most common type of lift hill and can be found on approximately 80% of coasters worldwide. Cable lifts, however, are much faster than chain lifts and are generally used for taller coasters such as Giga Coasters, although it has been done with the chain lift. You will also never fall back down a regular lift hill because the chain links are built to be a certain height, and if the lift hill stops, the chain dog, a retractable metal fin between the train, will become stuck in between the current two chain links because they are built high enough to prevent the chain dog from going over them. This is what causes the coaster to just come to a stop if the chain lift is shut down instead of falling back down the lift hill. Cable lift hills work pretty much the same way because the car latches onto the cable and is so tightly gripped the train will not fall back down if the lift hill stops. Another way of being propelled to the top of the ride is a launch. Launches accelerate the train without the need of a lift hill and rarely without the need of a drop. Most launches are made using linear magnetic technology called LIM, linear induction motor, or LSM, linear subduction motor. LIMs need a separate brake to brake on the launch track, if it's a shuttle coaster, but accelerate faster, whereas LSMs have a built-in brake function, but aren't as cheap. The way these work is that the train is pulled via extremely high powered magnets and LSMs are capable of pulling in the opposite direction to break the coaster. Another form of launch is a flywheel launch. This type of launch has a giant wheel spin at incredibly high speeds and is connected to a large cable which resets on the launch track and is pulled at high speeds when the wheel spins, propelling the train down the track. By the way, roller coasters do not have motors inside them. The next type of launch is a hydraulic launching. In this type of launch, a huge hydraulic motor is attached to a catch car via a long cable. The energy created by the hydraulic motor at the end of the launch pulls the car, catch car resting on the cable under the train at extremely high speeds, sending the train speeding down the track. The second to last type of launch is pneumatic launching. Pneumatic launches are extremely similar to hydraulic launches, but the energy is created using air, not water. Currently, the record for the fastest accelerating coaster is Dota Donpa at Fuji Q Highland in Japan. This, this coaster uses a pneumatic launch to propel, which shows why pneumatic launches are definitely something to be nervous over. The final type of launch is a drive tire launch. These consist of two wheels sitting horizontal to each other on the track and spin at high speeds in opposite directions, pushing the train down the track. The drop is fairly simple compared to the other coaster elements. 
After being pulled up the lift hill or propelled by a launch, the train crests to the top of the big hill and is pulled down by gravity. Depending on the steepness of the drop, the train will reach the bottom faster. For example, a train going down a 75 degree drop will reach the bottom faster than a 55 degree drop. The higher the degree doesn't always mean the faster the train reaches the bottom though. A train going down a 90 degree drop will reach the bottom faster than a 110 degree drop simply because a 90 degree drop is straight down and is the path of the least distance while a beyond vertical drop curves into itself, taking the longer path. The longest drop on a coaster currently is 456 feet in length, which is crazy considering that most coasters near us are only 100 to 150 feet in height. It is also pretty crazy because that drop is 90 degrees and is insanely long. You've probably heard me use the term airtime hill in this video before now and are probably wondering what that is. Airtime is the term coaster enthusiasts use to describe when you flow out of your seat outside of the bridge. For example, when you go over a large hill you either get ejector, pop up, or floater, floaty airtime depending on the shape of the hill. If the hill is steep and you go over it fast, you will probably get ejector airtime, and if the hill is long and averagely steep, you will probably get floated airtime. Airtime is basically a term used for a specific type of inertia. So when you are traveling up the hill, your body goes up with the coaster. But when the hill straightens out, your body is still going up, which makes you flow out of your seat for This continues as you are going down because your body is still trying to adjust to the dip, hill straightening out and the train is already going down the hill, and the restraints are pulling you back down. Also, the reason you get floated towards your restraint on a turn is the same reason for floating out of your seat during an airtime hill in the opposite way. Airtime is one of the things a coaster enthusiast looks for in a coaster because the ones that are generally considered fun and exciting have a lot of it. Another term you probably heard me use is the word inversion. An inversion is what the technical term is for when the coaster goes upside down. So a barrel roll and a vertical loop are both inversions, but are completely different kinds of them. There are too many types of inversions to list here, so I won't list them all, but generally they can be put into three classes, loop, roll, and a hybrid. A loop style inversion is pretty standard compared to the others, but is generally classified by having a teardrop or circular shape going up and down, and can come out either going to the same direction, back the way you came, or to the right or left of your original position. A roll inversion generally has the train traveling in a specific direction and coming out the same way. They also usually involve the train twisting upside down and twisting out of the inversion the same way, although there are exceptions. A hybrid inversion is an inversion that has elements of the first two types of inversion combined. An example of this is a cobra roll which does a half loop upward, does the exit half of a corkscrew out of the loop back the way you came, does another half corkscrew the other way, and does a half loop out to come out in the opposite way you did when you entered the first part. This sounds confusing I know, so here's a picture to show you what I mean. By the way, hang time is used to describe the air time you get during an inversion, only this time it is just because of gravity not inertia. The reason you feel like the coaster becomes more intense in the inversions is because of the extra g-force being exerted on your body during them. Remember kids, it's not smart to hop the fence and get in the way of the roller coaster. That is pretty much everything the average person should know about roller coasters. I hope you learned plenty and have a newfound respect for these amazing machines. I also hope you won't be terrified to ride something anymore just because you think it will fly out. It is completely alright to be nervous over something's intensity or how many inversions it has, or even the size of its draw. But as I said in the video, it is completely unreasonable to be afraid of flying out. Have fun and right on. Thank you so much to my parents for supporting me throughout this entire thing, and thank you to our student created video club at Riles for providing the materials needed to enter into the SIVA Awards. Also, Thanks to Johnny for putting up with me and agreeing to narrate for me.
You will also never fall back down a regular lift hill because the chain links are built to be a certain height and if the lift hill stops, the chain dog, a retractable metal fin between the <laughs> <laughs> No! No! <laughs>